All right. Well, hello, everyone. It is day one of ACR 2021. We are done for the, oh, look at my fingers, they're right? disappearing. Um, we are done for the day. Uh, we are tuning in from International Foundation for Autoimmune Autoinflammatory Arthritis, or AI Arthritis for short. I am Tiffany Westrick Robertson. I am the CEO of the organization, and I also am a person living with the diseases, uh, axial spondyloarthritis to be specific. And I have friends with me. You see, we all are in different locations though, because we all have the different the different backgrounds. So I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Deb to say hello and uh, take it from there. Awesome. Hey everybody, it's great to be back again. Um, again, it would be great to be in person, but fingers crossed for next year. I can still do it with this hand. <laughs> Um, it's great to be here. I am in Madison, Wisconsin, and um, it's been a long day. I think we started at 6.30 a.m. Central yeah. Time. Oh, and you can't, can't, you can't, this is my robe. <laughs> I still have it on the back of my chair for the 6.30 session. I love it. I love it. I am in the Madison, Wisconsin area. It's a beautiful day. I am tucked away in an office and I have my windows open, so it's beautiful out. Um, but I'm also in my comfy sweats because it's chilly nowadays. Um, I am um, formally diagnosed with RA at the age of 13. So 38 years um, living with the disease. And um, yeah, excited to be here again. Tiffany's my partner in crime as far as when we go traveling and can't wait for hopefully next year being in person and doing that as well. And we will be right there in person with you guys and typing this live. All right, I'll toss it to Katie next. Well, thank you, Deb. Uh, I'm Katie. Uh, I joined the International Foundation for Autoimmune and Autoinflammatory Arthritis back in February. So this is my first ACR with the team. So I'm super happy and excited. Um, I am the Senior Programs and Communication Manager. Um, I'm coming from that sure Detroit, Michigan. And I also was diagnosed with RA or JRA about 20 years ago. Awesome. And as much as I like, what? Well, I was going to say, as much as I want to meet everyone in person, I do definitely love being virtual to watch all these conference sessions with my kitty cats. So that is absolutely delightful. <laughs> um, and I'll hand it over to Stephanie next. Hi, everybody. I'm Stephanie Alete. I'm also known as the Young Face of Arthritis. And I am from Miami and I'm not wearing a sweater because it is still hot here. <laughs> but I'm super excited to be joining um, the AI arthritis uh, for this ACR. I'm excited. It's my first time and it was an amazing, amazing first day. Thank you. All right. All Effie. right. Yeah, so I'm last. <laughs> save, the, save the best for last right now. Um, so I'm Effie Coleopolis. I'm from the Chicago area in Illinois, and I'm also known as Rising Above Rheumatoid Arthritis. Uh, that's my blog name, and I was diagnosed at, uh, I would say, 18, maybe symptoms earlier with rheumatoid arthritis, so about 17 years now. And this is my first time going with, um, you know, AI arthritis, so... I'm really excited and to see what's going to happen tomorrow. And today was also an amazing day. Yeah. Awesome. Totally forgot to mention that I also have rheumatoid arthritis, guys. <laughs> yeah. Oh, not to say that. Kind of important. It's been a long day. Arthritis. A yeah, important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was diagnosed at five years old. So yeah, had it well. All right. So I'm the, I'm the only spondy in the group. Well, you used yeah. to be RA, right? I, I was. At one point, yeah. Yeah, I was originally diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, and that lasted what like, four years before it was changed. But there was there was no such thing as non radiographic axial spondyloarthritis, and when I was originally diagnosed, there was only ankylosing spondylitis, and um, that requires uh, more classifications in order to to achieve a diagnosis. And I did not meet the criteria, but I, it, I, that's what everybody thought it was, but I, it couldn't be because I didn't have the HLA B27. I didn't, I just didn't have the radiographic damage. And then they, they actually have changed the term, uh, ankylosing spondylitis is 
going out. That's not going, that's not the name anymore. It's axial spondyloarthritis. And um, so at ankylosing spondylitis now falls under if you have radiographic damage. And then if you don't, it's non-radiographic, but it's the same disease spectrum. So it's not a misdiagnosis. It's a, you, your disease didn't exist diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. And I finally actually learned how to say ankylosing spondylitis and now it's going to be out the door. And now it's going, it's going away. Yeah. Um, I, well, it'll I, always be there sort of just sort of like juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. It's yeah. not really the term anymore, but it's always right. going to be there. Um, okay. So what are we doing? We're coming um, to you. We're just a debrief. So at AI arthritis, we started a pilot program, which means a program that you test uh, so we started this, I guess, two years ago, and it, and it just so happened it was, it was always been virtual. So we originally planned on it being an in-person and virtual. Now it, it's all virtual. So we're hoping, yes, in 2022, it will be, it will be a hybrid program. Uh, we take patients from the community to go with us. So Deb, as she said, Deb has been going with, uh, with me to uh, ACR and ULAR uh, for years. And yeah. Katie is, has just started with the organization. And then we always bring two to three other people in the community that we just think are very deserving of an opportunity to go to the conference as well. And then myself and Deb in particular, with a lot of expertise <laughs> at, these, at these conferences, we sort of think become like a liaison between everybody and the experience and you. So what we're going to do is we do patient-led debriefs. We have an equal stake at the table, just like all of the other people who, who are attending these conferences. And it, we have our own persp perspectives, our own opinions. And so what we do is we go to different sessions and then we're reporting back to you, but in conversation style. So we're gonna give you some updates on what we learned. And then you're gonna see us all talk because that's how we roll. We're casual, real. Oh, so real, by the way. Okay, wait, I gotta do it again. Okay, yeah. wait for it. There it is, there it comes up. Okay, so um, we, are, we try to keep this as real as possible. If we were at an actual conference in person, what happens at the end is, there's social hours organized by the ACR or whatever the conference is, and people gather, they have wine, they have appetizers or whatever, just soda, water. So this is symbolic of the after debrief that normally would happen if we were in person. So what's also gonna happen, hot topics and themes every time they emerge. So, you know, a couple hot topics for sure, COVID, what else that did you all see for hot topics? Jack inhibitors, big time. Oh, that's a big one. That we're gonna go into that too, big time. <laughs> if you if you've heard about the the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA um, slapping on some extra restrictions for the Jack inhibitor um, recently, we we know why. So we're gonna go into a little bit that was covered today. So what else? What else were the were the hot topics or, or emerging themes? Precision medicine, definitely. I think we all started out super early in that study group. Well, we're gonna tell you more about that too. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was good, that was good fun. Um, uh, which one? Remission. Oh yes, remission. Remission came to the table for the first time when, Deb? I can't remember, two years ago? I think it started in ULAR and then it was it, ULAR for year. sure. Yeah, last year. So, um, it, and again, it shocked us because we're like, they've never talked about remission before. And I know, I think yeah. it was like, we were like, what? <laughs> we didn't know it was, it was, we were going to be talking anything about that. But what's happened with why we're seeing the research in remission is because about a decade ago that they, the, the rheumatologist community realized we have these amazing drugs, these biologics that are changing people's lives. And so prior to that, the treatment was wait for those, start with like diet, exercise, ibuprofen, that kind of thing. And so they flipped the triangle and they called it treat to target. And so what would happen is it, they would start to say, well, we believe that if you treat earlier, then you have a better chance of achieving better outcomes. And so what's happened is now over the last decade, they've been able to follow that 
and they're showing it's working. That's where these remission studies are coming in. So it's a really exciting time. And yes, that theme has, has been emerging as well. Lupus, I think, is the hot, is the, is the real hot um, disease. There's always a hot disease. Yes. <laughs> there's right one that just stands out over the rest although there's a lot for ra too yeah there's been new medications and there hadn't been for lupus forever so yes, i think for that's lupus nephritis big... in in particular which is um when it attacks your kidneys it's a it's a severe complication of lupus so lupus nephritis has never had a treatment and they came out with the first one this year so oh, wow. they talked about that too um, in, in a session that I attended, which was a year in review. So we'll definitely, we'll definitely go into that. And then some, uh, just a couple of the other things. Well, really, I wanted to just say cost. And we'll get into this more as, as we go. But cost analysis, essentially. I, I highlighted it in a lot of the notes, even if they, they use different terms, the theme was cost savings. So where we used to see them presenting research on safety and efficacy, which makes sense. Oh, it's like FE efficacy. I never even like put that together. <laughs> She's probably like, oh my God, I've heard that a million times. Stop. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, one of the one of the things that is coming up now is is cost. So people are starting to do research on how much cost savings can we have with drug pricing, with long-term care, et cetera. So that is something that's going to come up a lot. So let's jump into to sort of talking about the sessions. Um, one of the things real quick, just a few shout outs. What patients, other patients have you all seen that we want to shout out to? Carol Crow. Carol Crow, yeah. Carol. Carol's yes. been popular. Yeah, Carice. Yes, they, Eileen. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen them in a couple sessions. Eileen. I've seen Eileen, Eileen on more on Twitter than I've seen personally. That's true. Sessions, but yeah, <laughs> she's <laughs> blowing up Twitter <laughs> through Cricky Joints. So go Eileen. <laughs> I've seen Jennifer Walker. I've seen um, Stella and Juan Amada. And yes. I'm missing anyone I feel bad but those are the ones that I've written down that I remember uh, from bumping in bumping into virtually so we always like to give a little shout out anyone I'm missing well the only other one who again is slash like doctor is Caleb oh right, right. he's a patient <laughs> okay. yeah. Caleb Michu he is with a uh, forward national data bank who uh houses who built and housed our personal AI arthritis data bank uh, so that we can conduct research. And we love Caleb and we did go, we've seen him around and went into one of the sessions that he was moderating today. So shout And out apparently he loves Pokemon as we discovered. <laughs> go, Pokemon Go. Pokemon, yes. It's a great way to get exercise. <laughs> oh, it is a good way to exercise. Yes. <laughs> apparently he's really into that Pokemon thing that people were doing a few years back where you, I guess, find Pokemon or something. And it is an example of <laughs> using games to exercise. Oh my goodness. So, and then I wanted to also give a shout out to Dr. Kim who gave a shout out to us uh, <laughs> and Dr. Al Kim, Dr. Al or just Al as we like to introduce him. He has been on our talk show many, many times and he happens to also be my personal rheumatologist. So um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about him. But as we, as we jump into the sessions, we're going to briefly mention the one that we've, we've hinted about. Deb and myself and Katie went to a study group this morning. And the difference between a study group and a session is it's usually smaller and they, have, they cap it. And, and it also, they, it, it's interactive. You're expected to participate. And uh, well, Deb, did you want to just interject of when we realized that for the first time? Here yeah, we, we did that. Um, like, I think it was a couple of years ago. We're like, wow, that study group sounds really cool. We've never gone to one of those before. And Tiffany went to one and I went to another. In person. Yes, in person. So you walk. So typically when you go to a session, you walk into a, like an auditorium that can house maybe a thousand people, maybe. And um, this was a small room with maybe 
20, 20, 20 to 30 chairs. Well, once you open the door, you're kind of in there. <laughs> and you can't just walk back out. <laughs> yeah, that so, was actually pretty funny. Yeah, that was our introduction. But what a study, what a study group is, is um is this is on a topic where a group's getting together and they want to achieve something as a working group there's an objective to it and usually it continues so precision medicine being a topic that is extremely important to our organization we've been working on projects um, in that arena since about 2017 and when we say precision medicine that's different than personalized medicine so i just want to want to clarify that Personalized, even though you'll see they're, they're interchangeable, but there's a movement strongly to move towards the differentiation of, of what they mean. Personalized can be exercise, diet, method of, uh, you know, you like infusion, you like injection. Like there's a lot of personal preferences and precision is more about biomarkers, blood sampling on tissues. So it's a way of scientifically matching you to treatment. So, so that's the difference. And, and we've really been vested in this because we recognize all of us are individuals. I mean, just out of curiosity, how many, how many um, treatments have you been on, Stephanie? I've been on nine. It just, those are just the major players. Yeah. See, I didn't even know that. I just, just I was just rolling the dice just to, just to prove a point. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Effie? Well, the major players biologics I would say I've only been on three because one of them did work for a while so but yeah. other little drugs I think yeah it could be close to eight, nine as well yeah, yeah. so you know it's just it, it dub too dub's been on on a ton of them as well and and it's just the point is is that either they they lose efficacy or what's you know what's interesting is what will work amazing for one person doesn't do anything for another person and you could have the same diagnosis so that's where precision medicine um really is coming in and i and we started seeing it really for the first time stated out as precision medicine now but deb and i have been attending sessions for a few years where it's kind of hidden in the messaging they talk about biomarkers they talk about about um the individual need but the, the phrase hasn't been out there like it is in the titles which is also interesting to me because you're now you're seeing all of this study about cost. So that kind of ties in together. If you're going to move towards precision medicine, you need to show that the treatment that you're picking for an individual person is going to actually save money. So it, it really does make sense why, why those are together. But it was a, it was a good session. Um, Deb or Katie, I'm going to let you tell a little bit about it. Uh, in my opinion, just very scientific. Um, for me, I think I'm the only person or the person who has maybe the least experience with all like the scientific type of data uh, in this group. Um, but it was very interesting to see, you know, where it was going and how we might play a role. So. Okay. Deb, did you want to throw anything in there? Yeah, I actually, um, so both of the doctors were from um, Madison, Wisconsin, and they're part of the UW um, rheumatology program that my rheumatologist is part of. So I knew both of them. Um, it was, and I'm bad at names, Yoon Liang and Sarah McCoy. And um, Yoon Milong, Liang, sorry, is um, she is more into microbiology and immunology. And um, Sarah was um, a rheumatologist. And it was really, really, really down to earth people. And again, bringing up really interesting points um, about how they're studying different, um, different, what was it called? Omics? They, they yeah. abbreviated it to omics. Yeah. Yeah. Omics. Yes. And um, I, can't remember exactly what that stood for at this at this time of evening, but um, it was just really interesting how it was so individualized and drawing blood and being able to classify people into different kinds of medication and how it's affecting their DNA and their RNA. So it was really interesting as far as that goes. Yes. Yeah, so, so there were, it was, as, as, as Katie said, very scientific. And I think what was, they were showing us that there's been advancement. So 
when the scientists and researchers have been studying blood work and, and blood samples, and um, they have this new technology where they can detect universally all of the genes that that are that are running around in our body, right? And so we're now we're getting into the genetics, and they're able to identify different sequences. And they were actually calling it. Um, oh, where did I have it? I just I highlighted it. Oh. Um, well, now I can't find it. <laughs> I was going to say I think somebody added some notes and it went down somewhere. Um, um, but it, there was a really cool term that they used that I can't find. And there's immunogenomics, immunogenomics, no. um, genomics, <laughs> transcriptomics. Oh, no. Proteomics and then epigenomics. Nope, not it. Okay. Okay. okay, so anyway, when somebody else talks, I'll go and look at it. But the idea is that um, they they were able to put segments and little fragments of the blood onto these onto different slides and use illumination so that they can actually see little particles and the sequencing in different ways that they were able to before. Um, so what happened was they were able they were the question that the, the group was trying to to come up with or to get answered was how can we take this science now and put it into the clinic? How could a patient go to the doctor and have this incorporated into their treatment plan? Which, hello, that would be fantastic, I know. right? Um, so they were, they were trying to figure out how do we get from this amazing technology, molecular structures or signatures, molecular signatures. I love that, very, very precision. Um, and so, Essentially, they did. They they presented a study that took healthy people and took people who are diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, and they took these blood samples. And then, using this new technology, they put it under the microscope. They were looking at it um, in these lenses, and they were at, and, and they followed them over time, and they could see in the genetic responses who had RA and who did not. And they also could see as they were administering biologics, different medications to them. They could see that the changes were happening, but but never fully achieving remission. So that it led to a question like, what and why did some people get better than other people? So it really did show that by taking this technology, they could see in the same population of RA patients, some getting better and some getting that. That was the big like aha takeaway there. And so at the end, well, no, they went into breakout groups and, <laughs> and they were like, would you like to be in epidemiology or there are words so big, I don't even know. And, and we're texting each other. I said, Hey, you guys go into one of those, those breakout groups. Like, no. <laughs> so we were like the only ones I think that hung out in the regular room because there was no way we were going into those rooms. And so when they came back, they said um, their, their goal in there was to figure out missing gaps. How can we achieve this? How can we get it from A to B? And their, their answer was of all of the, they had like seven or eight different ones, but the number one way was to get more patients involved so they could do clinical trials. They need more than the regular clinical trials because you have individual response. And if you have individual responses, then you, in order to measure research so that it, is quantifiable so that it can be um, considered research that can be do that can be I know the word I'm looking for Useful. Stephanie you probably know the Useful. right word this but is I'm your group to school for this <laughs> that can be measured when we look at um, uh, quantitative data that's data that's turned into numbers that can be counted Right. So yes, and so and, and that's important if we're especially if we're going to be assigning these expensive treatments to, to people. So you need you need a, enough of that subgroup to be able to justify. Okay, this medication works right for this for this for this person. So we, of course, as the only patient group that was there at six thirty morning, <laughs> chimed up and said, "We'll help." And so it wasn't even five minutes when the session was over and we were emailed by them. So, so it was, it ended up being really good. So stay tuned on that one, um, because I think that's going to, to end up being a really exciting, uh, progression because it's a study group, which means we're, we're, it doesn't end here. 
it's so gonna find I'm, legs it's gonna find legs and we're gonna have i'm going that. to actually jump ahead we have like a little a little outline here we never follow mm -hmm. it in exact order because i want to turn it over to um there was one that we just recently saw right before we jumped on this not enough it was called not another pill Sounds yeah. right. Am I, do I have that right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it had a little bit more to the title, but yeah, like integrative pain management approaches or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Now I didn't spend a lot of time there, but I'm going to let you all, who wants to lead a, a, the, the telling everybody sort of the main takeaways here? I know, Stephanie, you asked a great question and it was answered, right? Oh, that's right. right. Yeah. Did. I was like, yeah, hey, go, Stephanie. <laughs> I felt famous for like a second. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I got noticed. <laughs> yeah, I, I was asking two questions actually. Um, there, it, there were so many interesting things that we learned from that one. But I think the overarching principle on this was that they were teaching clinicians to look at patients from this biopsychosocial approach use this biopsychosocial model when it comes to pain and so what they're talking about here is we're looking at the biological right so we're looking at like disease activity um you know uh, crp right blood work then we're looking at the psychological factors that could be influencing pain right so like trauma was something that came up that i thought was so fascinating that was by dr hassett and she was talking about how up to a third of chronic pain patients can have past trauma and as a she's a psychologist so as a psychologist she always is looking at addressing that trauma so that we can um treat that pain right and then the social approach of that biopsychosocial so we're looking at the influence of quality of life right Do, does this patient have social relationships that may improve their quality of life and thus their perception of pain and their experience with pain so i thought that was very fascinating Hey, Stephanie, so what is your job? <laughs> I'm a social worker. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think draws, again, why the passion. And again, it was really a good session too, I agree. But I just wanted to bring that out, that you're a social worker, because what your passion lies with. And again, how like it, it was just resonating so much. Yeah, yeah, it really was. I'm doing my MSW now. So, um, so yeah, thank you. So that really resonated with me. And of course this patient centered framework, right? We want the patients to talk about their experience and it's a focus on what the patient is experiencing. One of the things that Dr. I don't know how to pronounce his name, Jeanin. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. B-E-E-N-E-N. -E -E -N. I know Deb and I were having a hard time with that. <laughs> Grennan, maybe. Yeah, yeah, Grennan, maybe. Yeah, I'm not He's sure. From, yeah, he was from um, the Netherlands, so um, a European name. So that's why it was um, a little harder. But I agree. Um, it, but I, what I loved is it was individualized. Yes. Specific. Very specific. He talked about. He said, "What did he say?" He said, "Not every patient is obese. Not every patient is depressed." Not every patient has sleep disturbances. I love that because when you're looking at pain management, you want to attack this person's specific needs, their real problems, mm -hmm. right? So I thought that was just so fascinating that he was able to bring that up in his, uh, in his talk. And how, you made me think of something. How often do we talk to other people in our community and they're like, I'm so tired of my, my doctor saying, well, maybe you should lose weight or how are you like, like, oh, it must be your sleep. Even it just like stereotyping almost like this must be yeah. what it is. And this was completely the opposite. I didn't see the whole session, but I did see that beginning and he had sort of like a grid or a graph with different bubbles that had that sleep yep. and, the, and they said, everybody's map changes. Everybody's, you know, what, what one person might be disease activity is causing the pain. The other one could be the depression or the way your tolerance is or things. So, and, and I'm looking at the notes here and it was I, of, of just the notes, individual, personalized, customized. It, it's like every, every almost every other bullet has yep. that on there. 
Yeah. And, and another thing that I thought was just so great was um, Dr. Stamatos. She talked about the strengths based perspective. And um, this was so just so great to me because what it talked about was having the patient identify their own strengths. Right. And so like in social work, we talk a lot about the strengths perspective and, and what it looks at is what does this patient, everybody has, so it's this idea that everybody has strengths, everyone. So it could be there, there, maybe they have a great social support network. Maybe they have, they're just resilient, right? Maybe they're just a resilient person. And so when they're talking about managing pain, they, they want to have this strengths perspective, which is helping the patient identify, okay, what, what do I have that's working for me right now? Yes, I live with chronic pain. Yes, I'm in pain but what do I have that I can use to manage that pain better, right? So I, I thought that was really great. I love it. And I think that, that kind of leads pain. into- oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> So it's simply um, talking about a patient's strengths help with creating shared goals, creating shared decision-making with the patient. So the physician knows, you know, okay, they do see that as a strength. Maybe they can do this and I maybe wasn't thinking about that. So it helps create that dialogue, that conversation to create those goals. Absolutely. All right, Effie, did you wanna add anything? I think you guys covered it all, okay. quite honestly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was right there. So yeah, they okay. covered it all, yeah. All right, and so I'll just I'll just kind of add a couple extra, extra things on here. Um, the, the person who did present first from the Netherlands uh, was talking about a research, a research study in creating guidelines through ULAR, and we didn't say ULAR is the European Alliance of Associations for Rheumatology. They changed it their name <laughs> a few yeah, months ago. So I actually had to pull it up to say that because I, I can't, I, I keep wanting to say European League Against Rheumatism because yes. I've been saying that for a decade or whatever since I've been in in this in this field. So I, I haven't quite. Made the broken switch. the habit um, <laughs> of, of the old name yet, but um, but it it was what was really good about what he was presenting was that they are working on on these recommendations for pain management, all based on personalization, unique uh, the uniqueness of the individual and shared decision making, which is the process of of working with your doctor to come up with a mutual. Um, you have a mutual discussion on what your personal preferences are with their with their educated recommendations and together you come to a conclusion that is best for you the individual so um, it's also a good example of when we go to the acr or we go to you or we go to these scientific conferences it's not all about biologics right it's not all i mean because i think some people think that like oh research means we're talking about you know, biologics or, or disease modifying agents. And, and it's really wonderful to know as, and I think to be reassured as a patient, there's a lot of research going on about around non-pharmacologic, around fatigue, around exercise, around, you know, communication with our, with our doctors. So, and now cost. <laughs> and I didn't stay for this the whole second half, but the first, but on my very few notes I have here on the second part that was called No Magic Pill, that was talking about the the bridge of pharma and non pharma together. The first thing that was out there, it started with cost. It started with the cost analysis. <laughs> so here it is again. <laughs> yeah, I I just wanted to talk about that non pharmacological therapy. Um, one thing I thought that was interesting that they brought up was that, um, and I'll just spill the tea here. Um, <laughs> they were talking about psychotherapy um, interventions and one commenter kind of asked a question and, and I assume this person was a rheumatologist and he said, what was it that he said? He said, how do we convince patients to do these like psychotherapy interventions and, and I was like, oh God, right? <laughs> I wonder what he's telling his patients. <laughs> and, I, and, and she said it so beautifully. She's like, well, when we approach patients, the most important thing is to not tell them that their pain is in their head, 
right? That's the mo- I was like, hallelujah. <laughs> so, <laughs> said it. I was like, yes, 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 yes. And she said, what you want to, how you want to approach patients is talk about psychotherapy being used as a tool in their toolbox. So this is just one of the many tools that they can use to manage their pain. In addition to medication, um, Mm -hmm. you know, exercise, PT, OT, all those things. So, so I I just, I loved how she, that's a good, that's a really good point though, to bring up and you know, there is the cognitive behavioral therapy. That is something that really came up about two years ago. I want to say again, we will have to link to some of our, our debriefs from years, a couple years ago, because there was actually, there was actually a session. It, it, it's like pain. It's all in your head or, or, and it, really or was. it was like, a, but it was about, you know, that, that we have, we have different thresholds of pain and perceived pain and all of that comes from our brains and mm-hmm. how we're our perceptions. It's really, it was really fascinating. We'll have to, we'll have to link to that one because it was probably one of the most interesting ones of, of that session. But again, I think a testament to, um, to, to her for pointing that out that, you know, again, communication, better, yeah. better ways to communicate with, with, the, with the patient. Anything else anyone wanted to add to that one? I think that about covered it. All right, we're gonna we're gonna move on then. Um, so I said I was gonna circle back and tell you the story about the jack inhibitors. <laughs> so um, <laughs> like what? So okay, there are pill form of these disease modifying agents, biologic like um, that came out indicated in 2012 to treat rheumatoid arthritis. And I'm really exciting. There's pill form you know, because a lot of people, like I know Deb doesn't like to do the, the self-injections or, you know, so but I love infusions, people, but I yeah, love infusions. You do, that's yeah. true. But yeah. there are a lot of people that were just re- really excited. Well, so what ended up happening is the Food and Drug Administration, when they, they approved it in 2012, they also said, you, we are, we are going to require you to do another study. And, you know, research takes a long time. It, it, it takes quite a few years to go through the clinical trials, mainly because you've got to recruit a lot of people and it goes into different phases. It starts with small and then it goes bigger and it goes to bigger. Well, this was a trial that was to compare the JAK inhibitor with what's called TNF, a T, TNF inhibitors. So those are the first original biologics that came out. Patients, you might know them as like Enbrel and Humira. Uh, so it was, a, it was a comparison study over several years here to figure out if it was in fact equal in safety to these TNF inhibitors. And the data did not prove that they were as safe. It actually, there was high level of um, cancer. There was a high level of um, uh, cardiovascular, but I don't, if you're on these, I don't want you to be like, oh my God, because they also pointed out, not even in this session, it was actually a different session because this is a hot topic now because the FDA just came out a month ago, if, if a month, and gave it what's called a black box warning. And those are, and methotrexate has a black box warning. So those are when a medication has a lot of potential um, serious side effects. That's where the, the black box comes in. So um, all of the data is not in yet, but the things to point out and remember, the the sample, which would be the people that are in the, that's what they call um, the the number of people, the group of people that are in the research, it calls sample. Um, So the sample was um, mainly people over the age of 50, and they had to already have some um, cardiovascular comorbidity. So now think about that. If those are the people that were in that trial and it's showing more cardiovascular events, if somebody maybe 20 that had no cardio, the results would not have been the same, right? So I just want everyone, when when you're reading these kind of reports, 
just know that you really have to look into those type of things, the background, and don't just be fearful. And, and if you talk to your doctor, your doctor will likely know this background information as well, so that, you know, there's no alarm, the, these might still be the best option for you. Um, so, so that's sort of what happened. And it's a to be continued, because we don't have all of the data. But in saying that, um, it was interesting timing because this same medication was just very was showing to be pretty successful. Well, ankylosing spondylitis, that was where, what they had listed as of, we just said axial spondyloarthritis. But um, so with, with uh, in, in phase three trials, so it was just getting ready to like, whoa, we're going to put it on market and then this happens. <laughs> so now there is sort of this, the FDA has not gone forward with this for spondyloarthritis, but it has moved forward in Europe. So if you live in Europe, the, the JAK inhibitor is indicated now as a, as a treatment, um, but we're on hold in the United States because of this new, this new data that has come out. And interesting with me as a spondy, I was prescribed this drug and it did nothing for me. <laughs> so um, just goes back to the whole precision medicine, right? <laughs> Where um, oh, well, okay. one doesn't, doesn't work for the other. Um, and I'm on it and I love it. That? Did this, the, the Jack, or have you been hearing about it? Katie, you said you were on it. What did you say? I'm on yeah. that drug and it works great oh. for me. Um, and I haven't heard anything from anyone else. So I was, it was like nice your doc, to have like your the Your doctors insider. haven't said anything? Not yet. They might oh. at my next appointments, um, oh. maybe, but no, they have not said anything to me. And, and I think part of that is, is like I said, we do, what you don't want is to spread fear right? Yeah. Um, it sounds scary, but right. when you, when you dissect it and you actually look at the, the people who were in the trial, those, that's, kind, that's a pretty narrow, um, um, group. So I, I did, so I also wanted to bring this up in case there are people who have heard and they're like, oh, the FDA and the black box warning and things are shooting around social media. And they're like, you shouldn't be on those. Like, now you can be informed. <laughs> you, can, yeah. you can you can spread the word on well, that. Well, and so. with the fear thing too. Sorry, I was going to no, say. No, like, yes. Please. Even with the methotrexate too, that's obviously black box. Like you said, and so many people are all, people have been like so afraid to take that drug. I was one of them at one point. Yeah. But it's done wonders for me. So, and I know it's done wonders for many others. So there's a lot that goes into taking methotrexate and precision medicine because people who have a certain uh, like deficiency, they don't do well on methotrexate. And I forget what it's called, but it's like a gene marker. But if you know that, um, I think it's called MTHFR. I don't remember the name, but um, it's just kind of missing my mind right now. But that, if, when especially in women who have that, they don't respond well. So there's like a lot of things that you can find out precisely what is going on within your body. And then you can find out if it will work for you or not. That's a really good point. I know um, I've been on, I have been on about every medication for arth or for rheumatoid arthritis, just because again, I've had it for 38 years and everybody is different. And if I was afraid to go on the medications, I wouldn't be where I am now. I wouldn't be, you know, as active as I am. I've got a 22 year old son that, you know, through his high school, I was always going to basketball, baseball, football games, all of those things. And I would have missed out on all that. Um, I, I mean, I, these medications are life-changing for many and everybody is different. So um, in individualistic, and that's exactly where some of this research is just really great to hear, but I've been on methotrexate since I was 13 years old, started out on the pills, and then I've moved on to the shots and um, done really well on it. Um, but there's also labs that you have to do. So those are always good things to make sure things aren't happening. Um, so that's another thing that you can do is make sure you're following what your doctor wants you to do. Um, so just my two cents. <laughs> that is so fascinating. And thank you for sharing that, Deb, about your son. You know, yeah. I'm a mom too. So that yeah. always makes me feel good. Oh, know? yeah. But um, it kind of pulls me back to that to that session on remission, you know, and, and about how quality of life matters. And these drugs, yes, they have warnings, you know, yes, they have side effects. And but 
the whole um, message here, and I think all of us can talk about this because we've all been on so many, and probably between all of us, we've been on every single drug that there is for RA. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I would imagine. But um, yeah, that these drugs can help you improve that quality of life and, and, and um, minimize the level of risk for things like radiographic progression, permanent joint damage, all those scary things that we, that we don't wanna talk about, but that are very real, you know? Mm -hmm. so. And oh, I'm gosh. fixing what the damage that began with. That's why I've had to have reconstructive foot surgery and why my hands look the way they do now. Um, it's because it, that all damage happened before I started biologics. So again, they can be life-changing medications to stay informed. Absolutely. No, there, oh, go ahead. That, you know? Mm -hmm. We were talking about remission earlier and I'm, I'm if you're like, why, why is she looking over there? It's because I've got the, I've got the outline. And I, if I put it here on this screen, I can't see any of their pretty faces. <laughs> it's, like, it's not like I'm part of the conversation because I'm looking at a, at a piece of paper. So I'm looking over here because that's where the document is in the outline. Um, but one of the things, again, when I went to this year in review, that's literally what it was, like the highlights of the year in rheumatology. And so they did highlight a couple of studies that were talking about remission again. And one of the, in this, we've been seeing all of this research in the last year on these great things about treat to target, these great things about remission. Well, this one actually did not work. So that so I so I wanted I wanted to point this one out. So there was a trial given to uh, patients who with uh, rheumatoid arthritis who were sta stable, and they 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 called it I think it was two two joints or less was, was hmm. remission or, or stable. We all laughed about that a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> we had a good what's that. <laughs> Um, but, but so those are the people who were in the trial and the, the test was to treat, to target, to get them off of their medications. And while we have seen research, even just this year at ULAR on, um, trials that have shown that people who were treated early, that they are able to take, to, to, to be off of it, they did not talk about the history of these people. So this wasn't people who were treated to target and now they're pulling these off. These are people that are considered in remission or low disease activity. So I, I wish I knew if they were treated early or not, because I think that would maybe yeah. change what the response would be based on the other research. Anyway, um, they were given a trial half dose of their methotrexate because they were only down to methotrexate at this time. And so they were given a half dose to see um, if they would flare and unfortunately, um, most of them did not do well after the, they were they were gone to, going down to a, a half dose. So that treat to target um, was was not. Oh, I'm sorry, that wasn't rheumatoid arthritis. That was spondyloarthritis because it had it's the ASAS. There's so many different measurements. You've got the hack. You've got the the, the disease activities. There's so many of these acronyms flying around. Um, and I just saw, I just saw ASASHI, which is another, another measurement, but it's specifically for spondyloarthritis. So the primary outcome failed, but they had a secondary outcome. Surprise, surprise, cost effectiveness. <laughs> oh, my, here it is again. Uh, so at a different debrief, I will talk more about quality, Q-A-L-Y, quality adjusted life years. And in, an, in a nutshell, it is a cost-effective measurement tool that is controversial um, for its discriminatory um, measurements. One is perfect health, zero is death, and there's decimals in between. And perfect health would be a one. We as chronic disease patients can never be a perfect one. And so when they're pricing medications based on getting it to a one, we're sort of disadvantaged, but I will, I will explain. It's very complex and I promise I will explain it more. You have to tune in to our, our other debriefs, but they, they, they were doing it because of the qual the quality and they were, they were measuring what the cost would be for, um, for patients to be able, um, to, 
to at least have some improvement versus usual care. And in, in that scenario, the, the country saved money and they ended up going up 0.4 in quality of life. So I have to look more into that. It seems a little fishy to me that they failed the efficacy. <laughs> and, then, and then they're saying there was an improvement cost because that kind of proves the theory of something doesn't sound right there. Yeah. <laughs> so did you, you want to add something stephanie or, or some i heard somebody I was gonna, something. yeah i was going to ask um so you mentioned country so was it within the united states or a different huh. international I should, say, I should say um let's see it was oh it was actually international i think it was the uk okay and which would make sense because the uk the united uh, united kingdom and the united states um, are the ones that have been mostly uh, using these qualities to okay. price drugs and to show which drugs should be used um, over over others. So that would make sense. Those are the, the two leaders in that. But again, we're going to have we're going to have a whole more and more um, on that. And plus, just as a side note, in 2022, I'm coming back as a teacher. Used to be a teacher. Was college teacher for a decade, and. Um, we have decided we're going to put me back in the classroom, sort of right here, and, um, and we're going to we're going to focus on four different topics of public policy advocacy, and one of them is the quality. So um, it, we're hoping that by doing this, we can teach patients more about these these um, issues on you know a kind of a more con conversational level, peer to peer, and um, and then maybe make some tell you how you can help with with legislation and changing these these unfair practices so trust me that will come back so that was that was that was i'm like there it is i mean it's it, it just that is i would say to me that was one of the biggest themes that's coming precision medicine cost but they go hand in hand and individual care mm -hmm. so again it's it's just we see these themes and they almost always tie together somehow um so that was that's really it as far as the uh, the highlights and then there was COVID that they talked about but I wanted to go back to the debrief here um, and just ask I know um, a couple of you I I did watch it it was short it was called a lightning session we didn't under we forgot we didn't realize that and we're we're all like oh let's go to the session called why does remission in RA matter we're all excited about it yeah. and then I guess Stephanie got got in there first right and we hadn't made it in yeah. there yet. Yeah. <laughs> it's over <laughs> yeah, they were like what happened she goes now. well it was four minutes it's over <laughs> and then lightning. when i was writing the debrief i saw it's called a lightning session i'm like oh, oh i get it now a lightning session quick and quick and fast um but that's a good question why why does why does i mean whether whatever your diagnosis is why does it remission matter to all of you anyone want to just throw that quality of life <laughs> quality of life that's what they were saying yeah I mean, <laughs> I mean they kind of hit that right on the right, right, right on right I, I mean, feel like remission can happen in the beginning if there's early aggressive treatment for sure but it can also happen if you also have had damage too because I've seen it in other patients and people living with rheumatoid arthritis specifically where they had it for 15 years and all of a sudden they went into remission and they've kind of went on a bit of a journey to get there, but it's possible. Just you have to find again what works for you. The precision mm -hmm. medicine, yeah. So. so, anyone else want to want to throw out anything from that from that session? Or I have I have the bullet points in front of me. Did you want me to lead, or did <laughs> want to go I out didn't there? I just don't want to dominate. That one. I dumped the the session into our folder as far as the PowerPoint, but okay. I didn't get back to that one. I just agree with, with what I agree with what Effie said. Okay. Absolutely. I totally agree with what Effie said. And I think it's interesting because as you get like older in your uh, journey, right, that that topic is kind of like, for me anyway, it, it, it's kind of like, ugh, well, is remission realistic for someone like me who's had it for 25 years and I've been on nine of the major players as far as treatments you know and but I love that Dr. Wright was was bringing it up and quality of life 
and, and all these points like low disease activity, lowers the chance for comorbidities, right? Um, cardiovascular yep. disease is a real thing, folks, for people with RA, that's a real phenomenon that we are at an increased risk for cardiovascular disease. So it's, it's great, I thought that she brought that up because, and I'm just gonna be real here. I've had this a long time. I've had it longer than I've had it without, right? Because I've had it since I was five. I struggle with thinking that remission is possible for me. But this session reminded me that it should always be my goal. It should always mm. be my goal for my, I like that. my treatment. I love that. So I love that. And it started with, I'm looking at my notes here. It started by saying in the absence of a cure, quality of life is what matters. And, and I think that like you all said that hit it right, right on, right on the head. It said multiple factors drive the target of remission, um, in practice. Then they, they talk more about the economic value. <laughs> it just, it just kills me how that just keeps coming up. But they said low disease activity lowers the chance for comorbidities, risk of infection, decreased likelihood of orthopedic episodes and lowers depression, which we just talked about from, an, from that's another kind of theme that that's coming up here is that it's the whole mind body it's not just you know pain is a lot of different dimensions um and well this this quote it just made me it kind of made me laugh so i had to write it on here just for just for humor reasons but they were they were presenting a research so when we're running these sessions they're always showing research they're basing their conversations on on you know research has been conducted and in the study it said um, of the patients with depression at baseline, baseline meaning when they started the research. So that's like just starting in the beginning and they measure and they, they see improvement or not improvement. Of the patients with depression at baseline, those that achieved clinical remission were less likely to remain depressed <laughs> compared to those uh, who didn't. And I just <laughs> laughed and I was like, well, yeah. <laughs> 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 Who wouldn't be happy if they went into remission? I mean, oh my gosh. I mean, it's kind of a big bummer if you're the one in the in the trial that did not be depressed too. So <laughs> I just right. I just found that funny. I, I it caught my eye and, and I had to go back actually and look at it again to see if I saw that right. Um so I, I just had to throw that in there. It was funny. But it also talked about uh, you know our work, life, social, our existence for uh, uh being present. In, in life and how that that also becomes improved, which then, you know, it adds in, it feeds in, it feeds into all of that. And, and, so. and I, I want to just say, and right, so some people out there listening might be thinking, oh, there's no way remission is possible for me. You know, I, I feel that I'm there with you. So maybe let's reframe this, right? Let's go back to the CBT, cognitive restructuring, right? Maybe yeah. remission might not be be possible, but maybe aspects of remission, right? Like being present in your social interactions, right? Being there for your son's soccer game or, or baseball game or having a part-time job. Those little aspects of remission state may be possible for you. So, so let's think about it like that instead. I 100% agree. Again, 38 oh, years. Stephanie. I know. Yeah. Oh, a round of applause. Um, <laughs> Ebony inspired me. Her words. Yeah, but oh, seriously, happy with permission. <laughs> yeah. Thirty-eight years of having this disease. Um, I've never been a depressed person, and I think you know a big part of that is having medications that make me feel better. Yeah, mm -hmm. I have to go through these different reconstructive surgeries. But that's minor. I mean, I've got a 20 year, 22 year old son that, I mean, we go to concerts, we go, you know, whatever we want to do. Again, we're pretty tough ladies too. I think all around this table here, we are tough ladies. We are, if we can, we're not going to let our diseases interfere with what we want to do. And um, I think that is that's why I'm not a depressed person is because I'm still participating in life. When the door gets shut and I mean, life is really bad. I'm going to have my bad moment, but there's another side to that. I pick myself back up and dust it off a little bit, you know, fix my little bruises and <laughs> move on with life.
I mean, I'm like you, Deb, but not everyone is like that, you know. No, one hundred percent. When they get a cold, they're like, "I'm not feeling well. I can't do anything for two months," you know, or like something right. like that. So it's like there's a mindset. certain type of personality mindset, but those are tools and resources that can be given to people to thrive too during yes. that time. Thank you. And that's what is lacking, you know, the resources and how to go about it. Right. And they don't, yeah, they're not given any, their doctor's not giving them those tools for their toolbox, like Steph mentioned earlier. And, you know, that's why folks like you guys have blogs that you guys do to keep reminding folks about that type of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for saying that, Effie. I think that is so critical. And, and it just reminded me because Look at Effie. Effie's like my little inspiration. Oh, come on. <laughs> saying brilliant things that like just bring me back. But it, it, it brought me back to Dr. Hassett again. She's talking about how some people, right, engage in these pain avoidance behaviors, right? And what we're talking about that is, oh, I don't feel good. I'm going to stay in bed. I'm not going to push through, right? So certain tools that, that patients who, who have those tendencies, right? And I feel like we all have those tendencies, mm -hmm. but some more than others right? ACT, acceptance commitment therapy, these different um, techniques that can be taught that, so if you are feeling like that, feeling like you're someone who, who just tries as much as possible to avoid the pain, which we all do that, but maybe oh, yeah. feel like it's impeding with your ability to live your life, I encourage you to look into this uh, acceptance commitment therapy and behavioral activation, different, different therapies that can teach you how to, um, you know, be present in your life and kind of, I want to say accept that pain is real, but, um, but yeah, yeah, accept. That. Maybe at some point we could, we can all sort of delve into that and, and do some exercise, like, seriously, do some exercises on it together, kind of lead the way. And, and I think that that could be a really um, beneficial, Powerful. not just for ourselves, but for a lot of people who are like, well, I, it sounds good, but I don't even know where I would start. Yeah. So, and that's the thing. I think like sometimes people may get overwhelmed and they're trying to do it on their own, which mm -hmm. is the bad right. thing. You know, it's not a bad thing to do things on your own, but sometimes you do need the help of a professional or something other than, you know, you're just your rheumatologist, you know, how to um, modify. Yeah. yeah. Modifying. So maybe that, that may, I can see that as something maybe, especially as this research progresses, maybe as we're going to these conferences and starting to maybe branch out and, and, and do some, some exercises on our own, like help, helping others. I can totally see yeah. that. See, I love these debriefs because that's what happens. <laughs> like the things you weren't even planning, like good ideas spawn. Yeah, good one. Uh, good one. That was, Thanks. that was really good. Too. Um, so the, the last, the last one that we're just gonna, we're gonna briefly mention because it's going to come up a lot. So there's tons of things and that is COVID of course. And so I, I just first want to just give a shout out. We did it in the beginning, but um, Dr. Al Kim or Dr. Al or just Al, that's how we always say it because it's kind of progressed. He's been on our talk show, AI Arthritis Voices 360. <laughs> Since um, for uh, he's been a recurring guest for about a year, and he also helped me co-found Roomy Rounds, which is a trademarked um, concept where patients and rheumatologists sit at the table as equals, and we talk about the hard the hard stuff. And so it's not a question interview answer, but I had trouble calling him anything but Dr. Kim because he's my doctor, and then he kept saying. Just Al, so I'm like, okay, Dr. Dr. Al. And then finally I got to Al, because I he's like, it's just Al. <laughs> so, uh, but it was hard for me. But even again, at those roomy rounds, we all like it, it's Al, it's Jeff, it's Vivica, it's not Dr. Strand or or, or Dr. Sparks or that it's we're all equals. So anyway, um he has done he has been part of a really important study in um in COVID through Washington University in St. Louis. And uh, I, we will go over, we'll share some of the links to that as well. But the bottom line is it was studying vaccination response in people on our medication. And so yes, there's loss of efficacy, which we know, but the research they were doing really was on the forefront of helping us realize that, okay, we might not be creating as many antibodies because of some of the medications. So that was really a, a stepping stone to getting to that knowledge. 
so I'm so proud of him. <laughs> and he also came on our show several times talking about this, um, being a liaison about COVID education. Um, so much to our surprise, we're watching him present this today. And then at the end, he says, and I, he says something like, and I, and I just want to take a moment to really give thanks to, 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 to some groups who have really been you know, doing great work and, and helping to disseminate this. And it had creaky joints, hello to creaky joints that we love, um, and, and our logo on there. And then he actually said my whole name and I almost fell out of my chair. <laughs> it's like in the Tiffany West with Robertson and I went, and I actually, my response in the chat was yay. And I thought that was so unprofessional, but it was real. <laughs> yeah. I, was ex I was so excited. Um, so anyway, we wanted to just, that was really cool. Um, so in, a, so the, in addition to that happening, and then the Precision Medicine Research Lead emailing Katie and myself and Deb five minutes after the session, then also I'm part of the ACR um, working group for telehealth and I'm the patient representative under our organization and they presented uh, the competency recommendations today. And I was like, oh, this is such a good day <laughs> for our organization because it had my name and it had our organization under it. Um, so just, just, a, just, it was a good day. Um, but so as, as far as COVID, um, we're going to circle back and talk more about it. I think just a, a couple little things that, that I wanted, I went into a session called ethical quandaries with COVID-19. It was mainly history, so I'm not, I'm not going to recap the whole thing. It's, it's things that we know. They're sort of how we got to this place. But just a couple things I wanted to throw out because it's going to come up again when we, come, when we circle back on COVID and talk more about treatments and lack thereof and people like Deb were pulled off at Temra. That's for a different debrief. Um, but it did, they did do surveys on vac vaccination hesitancy. And one of the things that, a couple of the statistics that I thought were, were quite fascinating, um, they brought up studies from earlier when the vaccinations were just coming out, you know, just coming out and polling people, will you get it, will you not? And the number of people who originally said, you know, I'm probably not gonna get, get vaccinated, but they weren't the people who were adamant about no vaccinations. So you had, that group that said, absolutely not, no way, I'll never be vaccinated. They really didn't budge. <laughs> the numbers didn't change. When it went back, they never got vaccinated. But out of the people who said yes, and then, you know, no, but not a hard no, 20% actually did end up going and get vaccinated. So it kind of showed, there was research now that's showing there's this middle group. So you've got your people who aren't going to budge, no matter what, I know people like that. <laughs> you all might know people like that. Um, one of them lives in my household, which is always an interesting conversation. Um, and so then you've got, so there's this middle ground. So they're doing research to show it can be possible. And there are ways of those people who might end up choosing differently. Um, they said one of the, they brought up the, the choose has a lot to do with freedoms and, um, but the interesting part of that was that those same people who they polled who said, I won't, because there were reasons, they listed a whole bunch of reasons, but the one that said, I can choose, nobody should tell me what I have to do, it's my freedom. Though that group of people, of those, not all of them were hard nose on vaccination, there were only hard nose on COVID. Oh, and so that was a really, and, and, it, and it tied into like the political. So they were people who had certain political. So that was really an interesting one, I thought, because it just showed that um, they, because one of the things they listed was, was politics. And it, it was just, I thought, wow, I, how, how interesting is that? Um, and we got to come up with another word that interesting because we said it about 50 times here. So. <laughs> <laughs> you get the thesaurus out. Fascinating. Um, but then this recent statistic, and I'm going to end it with uh, end it with this um, because it will tie into a future debrief uh, on the. There's a treatment one too that Deb and I were going to go to, and we just ran out of time today. But we do know that the, stati the statistics are out with no news to anybody. Around 95% of the people who are hospitalized with severe COVID are ones that are unvaccinated, regardless if they have comorbidities or not. The fact is that they are unvaccinated. 
And um, there was just some, some data that came out from Western United States on a ho hospital chain. So not like a hospital, like you know, the hospital, it's the group, the hospital group itself, that um, the people in their hospital um, who are unvaccinated are 42, are of the people in the community, people who are unvaccinated were 42 times more likely to be hospitalized and die than vaccinated people. And, um, and then they went in a little bit to nurses and doctors are angry because it doesn't have to be this way, which is how I'm going to end the little debrief because that is a to be continued. We just put out a press release last week with Dev and other persons who are dealing with a shortage of our uh, medications being taken from them to treat hospitalized COVID patients who 95% are unvaccinated. So I tell you, it is not just the nurses and the doctors who are pissed. <laughs> I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, so that that is a conversation to be continued. But that that's a lot, and that's just one day. <laughs> that's just we didn't even see everything. <laughs> no, not even close. Maybe not even close. Maybe close. Maybe everything. Maybe more like close to half. Or... Yeah. So so in in wrapping this up, and what and just so everybody knows, you know, there's we're gonna have a long version where it's all it runs all the way through, but then we chop it. So there's gonna be short versions, and we'll have timestamps so that if there's just one topic of interest you want to jump to, that you can. Uh, did I forget anything? Was there anything else that you all wanted to add that you saw today? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Effie, Stephanie, first day at ACR. Thoughts? It's good. Sorry about my uh, Zoom going to my name. The one thing that I noticed is your computer tends to die out because you're going to all the sessions. So <laughs> that's the thing about virtual that I do not like. <laughs> Agreed. Stephanie, any any? I, I'm Thoughts? not. I'm not tech savvy, so this yeah. was a big challenge for me. That's a learning curve. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, I can say the the there are there are definitely pros and cons. As as someone who have, have been to them with Dev, um, depending on where they're located, some of the some of the conferences are more patient friendly than others. And when you have to be at a session that's on one wing of the conference center. And then the next one starts 15 minutes later and it's way in a, not only on the other side, but maybe a hotel next door. <laughs> You're trying to get, it's a lot. Um, so, in a, in a, in a, and, you, and we do get to jump in and out and see more. We're in a you know, real life situation. You have to wait till the speaker changes and then you stand up and you leave. And, um, you know, but so there, there are some, some benefits uh, for that, but I think we're all ready to get back in person. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and I loved it. it I, I, I I just loved it. I felt pumped. I mean, it was ah, just dream come true. Gotta say. All right, good. Well, it's just the beginning. So um, this is the way that you all can go with us too. So listen to what we're saying. Join the conversation, whether it's in the comments on, on YouTube. You can also um, email us, info at arthritis.org, or you can, you can message us at any of our social media, which is IFAI Arthritis. So I think that's it. How can they find you both? How can they find you, Effie? Oh, Rising Above RA on Twitter or Instagram. Okay. Yeah, I've been tweeting about the ACR. Okay, fine. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Stephanie, how can everyone find you? Um, usually it's just at the young face of arthritis, but on Twitter, because there's only a certain amount of words, it, it's at the young face underscore RA. So Got it. Right there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and we'll be ta and we'll be tagging, and we already have been, but we'll definitely be tagging them also in our social media posts too, so you can find them that way. Well, thank you all for a great first day of the ACR 2021. We are signing off. We're glad it's daylight savings here, so we're all going to get an extra <laughs> hour of sleep, and we'll be starting off again tomorrow. So, signing off for for all of you, and um, join us again. Bye, everybody.